We are delighted to be in God's house this morning and uh, no better place to be. You've heard me say that many, many times. Uh, I want to share with you the message, uh, I should say, the message title today is Character and Destiny. Character and Destiny. Probably if it wasn't for Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, uh, we wouldn't probably have heard of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Uh, that's an account, of course, referring to the gallant efforts of uh, an American patriot who alerted the colonial militia of approaching British forces before the battles of Lexington and Concord in uh, Massachusetts. But few people have heard of a fellow by the name of Israel Beisel. Israel Beisel. He was a humble post rider on the Boston, New York route. After the battle, he was ordered to raise an alarm to arms to arms, the war has begun. And he was to travel, he was in New Haven, Connecticut, and he was to distribute the message uh, down his postal route from General Joseph Plamer. Beisel reached now, I'm going to botch the name, and Pastor Fred might have to help me. Worcester? Worcester? Did I get that right? Massachusetts? Worcester? Worcester? There's no I in there, but it's, it's Worcester. Okay. I'm, I lived in uh, Massachusetts for a few months, and I didn't take. Worcester, Massachusetts. So, Beisel reached Worcester, Mass- <laughs> Worcester, Worcester, Massachusetts. Now, normally what takes a day's ride, he arrived in two hours. And according to the story, his horse died over, because of overexertion. He only stopped there to get another horse, and he pressed on, and three days later, it was April 22, he was in New Haven. He rode to New York April 24, and he stayed the saddle, which is what they called it back then, stayed the saddle, until he reached Philadelphia the very next day. Israel Beisel rode 345 miles in 106 hours, that is four days and four rather, yeah, four days and 10 hours. Four days and 10 hours, something we can do very quickly, of course, in our cars today, but back then that was a massive feat and it showed the urgency of the message and he was successful because of his urgency in signaling militia units throughout the Northeast to mobilize them for war. Now, it is true his methods were extreme, but that's because the times were extreme. It's true that the writer was in earnest because the times were earnest. You see, when issues are critical, it requires immediate action and attention. There are some things in life that just can't be put off to tomorrow or the consequences are going to be absolutely catastrophic. Some things matter little. And if we put them off until tomorrow, that's going to be okay. But then there are other things that if we put them off, certainly they could be our demise and even and including spiritually. If your life is flickering, your your flame is flickering and it's about to go out, that's a time of urgency, a critical moment where one must let Jesus fan that flame and bring that light back to the life. I want to invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 12, if you'd be so kind. Luke chapter 12, and I want to look at a Bible verse with you, a couple actually, where Jesus talks about the need to shine our lives, our lights brightly. Notice Luke chapter 12, and we'll look at verse 35. Jesus said, let your waist be girded, and what about your lamps? Let them be what? Let your lamps be burning. That's right. So this idea of girding the waist, um, that kind of we'd, we'd say today, buckle up your belt. Make sure your, you know, your, your, your pants don't fall down, so to speak. Uh, back in ancient times, men wore robes, and of course, they had long flowing robes. And this idea of girding the loins, girding the waist, they had a rope around their waist, And they would pick up the middle part of the robe and then they would tuck it in to the waist uh, so that they uh, would be freer to take uh, larger strides and perhaps even walk. So when Jesus says, gird up your loins, he's talking about free yourself up so that you you can do my bidding. You can do the thing that I've asked you to do. Don't let anything hinder you. But he goes on to say, let your lamps be burning. Now, this is in the context 
Well, let's look at the context. Verse 36, he says, And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from where, friends? The wedding. Let me ask you a question. It's a theological question. Are we in the day of the wedding today, right now? Are we in the day of the wedding? And you may wonder, what are you talking about, Pastor Chris? Yeah, we are actually in the day of the wedding. You remember the story Jesus told Matthew 25, the wise, foolish virgins, they went into the wedding. And certainly it's a story that one could, uh, we could certainly talk about uh, Jesus' return and him being the, the bridegroom and the, they were, uh, they, the, the bridesmaids were foolish, they were asleep, but they didn't have their lamps trimmed and burning. But when Jesus goes into the wedding, it's really a re- reference to the judgment. Jesus is going into the investigative judgment. And when he comes out of the wedding, when he comes out of the wedding, it's when the judgment closes and he'll return. And, uh, and he will collect his people. Be yourselves like men who wait for the master when, who will, uh, when he returns from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. So the context is last day context. As a matter of fact, when you jump down to verse 40, notice, therefore you also be what? Ready for the son of man is coming in an hour you do not expect. So the context is the return of Christ. The context is last days. And Jesus says, make sure your loins are girded, you're you're wasted up, and make sure that your lamps are what? Burning brightly. Make sure your lamps are burning brightly. It is crucial today to ensure that we are living lives that, uh, that shine brightly for God. We don't want to burn out. We don't want them to die out. But we know that Jesus is the type of Savior that if that lamp is flickering, if that light is about to go up he'll, out, he'll come and he'll fan on that flame and, and light it ablaze. He's not going to squelch it. He's not going to put it out. That's not the type of Savior we serve. If something's about to go out, he'll strengthen that which remains and he'll bring back the fire. And so Jesus invites us to make sure that our lights and our lamps are trimmed and they are burning. So just by way of review, real quickly, let me ask you a question. This is the last message in, the, in this four-part series, Burning Brightly Without Burning Out. What is the secret of success? Do you remember? The secret of success, the secret to a life that burns brightly for God. Oh, man, I'm so glad someone's been listening. All right. So divine power with what? Human effort. All right, so let's do that again. The secret of success is the union of divine power with human what? Effort, that's right. That's the secret of success. And divine power comes to us when we spend time with God in prayer, when we spend time with him in his word. Also, when we're, when we're, when we're doing something good, when we're doing something for others, uh, involved in loving service for others. Remember, that's what keeps a, fl- a flame a lit, air and fuel and heat. And we've been focusing on the human effort part. God gives us the inspiration. God gives us the power to will and to do of his good pleasure. We've been talking about the human, human effort part. And those are the things that we can do, that God can bless so that we can serve brightly for him. Uh, God doesn't bless dumb decisions. Um, he'll help us uh, and uh, he'll guide us to make better ones, but we want to make the best decisions we can and put forth our best efforts so God can bless that to live a life that shines brightly for him. And you remember we talked about what a man thinks he or she is and what a person does that a person is, just like a fruit tree. You come to an apple tree, it bearing apples, you know what type of tree it is. It's an apple tree. It's bearing mangoes, you know it's a mango tree. You know them by their fruits. Your destiny, our destinies are determined upon what we, based upon what we think. That's the platform. That's where we start. What you think, as a man is that he is. What, what a man thinks that he is. And so we think our thoughts lead to words and actions. Repeated actions lead to forming habits. And it's our habits that forms the character. And it's the character that determines the word, the destiny. It's the character that determines the destiny. So so there are only two roads, one that leads to life everlasting and the other road leads to to damnation and eternal death. And Jesus invites us to travel the narrow road, travel that narrow road. What, What we think turns into words and actions. Words and actions repeated become habits. Habits forms the character. Character determines the destiny. It all begins right here. 
where we think, how we think. And, uh, and we want to talk a little bit about this morning the habits and the character, and I've got a few more of those pointers for you. Those, uh, when we look, at the, uh, we look at those contrasts, those uh, contrasts, those delicate contrasts of life, because there is a fine line between success and failure in life. There's a fine line between happiness and success. And so if we want to be successful for God, live a life that shines brightly for Him, it requires consistent, careful monitoring of those delicate contrasts. So we're going to look at that in just a few moments. But for just a quick moment, what we keep doing, what we do, we keep doing, and that's called a habit, and it's the habit that shapes the character. You remember King Saul? King Saul was uh, not... Well, actually, you looked at King Saul, according to what we read in the Bible, and you would, uh, you would say to yourself, yeah, this guy has kingly bearing. This guy's a handsome fella. He, he could be king. And, and actually, he was chosen to be the first king of Israel. And he had a good start, did King Saul. He started well, but King Saul ended up developing some bad habits, developed some bad habits. It started in his head. It all started in his head. And then it it transferred into action, which then developed, of course, into bad habits. And by the end of his life, his character had become so marred that in seeking help, he sought uh, out the witch of Endor for counsel. You can't get any bad, can't get any worse than that. But is it possible to turn bad habits into good habits? And the good news, of course, is yes, with God's help, anyone can turn bad habits into good habits. Unfortunately, Saul didn't seek the right person. He didn't seek God's help and surrender himself to God. And so he was in this pit of despair and jealousy and envy and hate. You remember, uh, you remember he was, he had a very trouble, Saul had a very troubled mind. And he called the young boy in, the young shepherd boy in David to play on his harp. And, he'd, and through the music, he would calm Saul's nerves. But then when Saul would rile up and he'd get angry, he'd, at one occasion, he threw a javelin at, at David and David escaped for his life. Saul became very jealous of David. Jealousy led to envy, led, envy led to hate. He wanted to kill David. And David, through some of the younger years of his life, was running for his life. That's, this is King Saul. But he didn't seek the help he should have sought He could have climbed out of that pit of despair and jealousy and envy and hate. You see, once a person starts down the wrong road, it's very hard to turn around. But it is possible to turn around. It is very possible to turn around. Someone said that habits actually are like good friends. If they're being good to us, we've got good habits. Habits are like good friends. They can be good friends. Think about, for example, the time that you save. Uh, if you have tie-up shoelaces, I don't, I just slip my shoes into, my feet into my shoes on Sabbath morning, but if you have tie-up shoelaces, think about the time you've saved yourself over the course of years, learning how to tie your shoelaces when you were very young. How long does it take you now? As a matter of fact, do you even think about it when you tie up your shoelace? No. Why? Because you developed a habit. Habit is a friend. When you develop good habits, they become your friend, you see. Think about the time you save to tie up your shoelace. Think about the time uh, it's, it takes you to type up a letter. I'm so glad that, uh, that I, we, 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 when our kids were younger, we said, you're going you're gonna to be learning how to type. Because me, it's like, you know, it's kind of like this. It just doesn't go so well. But you're going to learn how to type. And so they would have little uh, computer programs for them. So they learned how to type. And man, they type fast. And I got a little jealous as dad. I wish I could type like that. But when I, you watch them today, they just get on the computer and looking around, typing like this. Pretty impressive. Why? Because they learned how to type. Time, type learning, t- learning to type, learning a habit, good habit, saves time. Think about all those things. Think about those things. Hours spent repeating a thing develops a skill that now you do unconsciously. You don't even think about it anymore because you've done it, you've done it so many times. That's a habit. Habits are our friends. Um, you can, it's interesting when you think about the mind, and I'm not going to get into the science of it, but, and I'm going to be very simplistic with my explanation, but essentially, uh, when we form habits, it creates trails in our minds. You know, if you walk a, a particular path, a grass, grassy path, and you keep walking over that, that same ground over and over again, what happens to the grass uh, that's, uh, that you've walked over? 
Yeah, and it ends up being uh, yeah it ends up being pressed down underneath your feet. You end up blazing a trail. That's right. And because you've repeated that, that same course, you've gone down that same path and you've created a trail. And when we do something over and over and over again, we develop these trails in our minds. And sometimes those trails are good trails, those are good trails, and sometimes uh, th- those, some of the trails, some of the trails, I should say, are good trails. The, the negative thing or the, the disappointing thing about the negative trails or the bad trails we've developed, which are the bad habits, um, is those, those trails don't disappear until Jesus comes back. So you can develop a good habit and create a new path, but you can always go back on the old path again. Um, those, won't, those won't go until Jesus comes back. And though this corruptible will put on incorruption, this mortal will put on immortality. But the good news is new trails, new neural pathways can be created. It's amazing uh, what science has discovered and it squares with what the Bible has told us time and time again. And so we can develop good habits and that's the, that's the good news. And habits, habits form the character or shape the character. And it is character that determines the destiny. It determines the destiny. When we talk about character and character traits, we're told that a man is more, has more influence than what he says. Who we are influences people more than what we say. When we think of character traits, we think, you can think about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and so on. There's some of the softer virtues, but the Bible also talks about some of the more firmer virtues, more, more active virtues, uh, character virtues, or character traits. For example, like uh, courage and, and mental and moral decision, energy and perseverance. These are some of the more active traits, character traits, but they all, they all the characteristics that God is seeking to develop in our lives through the power of the indwelling spirit. And so God wants us to develop good habits and because it's the habits that form the character and it's that character that determines the destiny, you see. So I want to talk with you here a little bit about these a couple of de- delicate contrasts of life. And uh, it has, has to do with habits, it has to do with the way we think, and it has to do with character, and it has to do with legacy and destiny. So let me talk about some of those. Now, up to this point, we've talked about choosing integrity over image. We talked about being on purpose, having a, a purpose for your life, living your life priorities, recognizing that success in life comes through both aptitude and attitude. We talked about daring to dream. We've talked about just doing it, decision, being decisive, making plans and, and fulfilling and acting on those plans. We've talked about putting off procrastination, right? Putting off procrastination. To be successful, we must constantly and carefully monitor the delicate contrasts of life. So I want to look at the difference right now between burnout and enthusiasm. Burnout and enthusiasm. We want to be fit to live. So this is a lesson on health for us here this morning, and there's a couple other things we're going to talk about briefly. But Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's what God desires for his children today, that we might, uh, we might, we might be able to move and, 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 and breathe and live and share the light that God has put in our lives with others. So let's talk about burnout and let's talk about enthusiasm. What is burnout? Well, burnout is simply extinguishing, the extinguishing of your spiritual, mental, physical, or emotional enthusiasm. That's what burnout is. The extinguishing of your mental, spiritual, uh, physical, and emotional burnout. What is enthusiasm? What's enthusiasm? Enthusiasm is derived from the Greek word, and I'm not going to pronounce this correctly, enthusiasmos, enthusiasmos, which really means to be filled with God. That's a new take on enthusiasm, isn't it? Burnout is the extinguishing of your spiritual and mental and physical and emotional enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is derived from the, uh, it means to be filled with God. The challenge that we have is being balanced enough to maintain enthusiasm without burning out. It's a delicate contrast. Remaining enthusiasm without burning out. You cannot be your best. You cannot do your best if you do not feel your best. 
You cannot do your best if you do not feel your best. Overall good health is critical to our peak performance in the spiritual life and in life in general. Very critical. It was John that said, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. God wants us to be healthy. He wants us to be spiritually healthy and mentally and physically and emotionally healthy. And it's a composite thing that we're talking about here. I have a friend who uh, is really a medical missionary, a bit of a coal porter and a bit of a medical missionary. And he travels the globe and meets with clients and he helps them come up with a plan to help them deal with some of the health issues. It might be, um, it might be high blood pressure, it might be uh, high cholesterol, it might be they have heart disease, uh, whatever the issue might be. And so he's working with a company, uh, a couple, I should say, not a company, he was working with a couple um, over there in the Middle East and he was working with them and helping them uh, with, with, with how they could eat, things that, things that they could eat that would be better for them, getting them on an exercise regimen, doing different things for them. And um, the husband, uh, his issues uh, became much, much more minimal. They weren't as concerning as before as he was working on this regimen. But the wife's conditions remained the same. And she, he was doing, she was doing everything he was doing. They were both doing everything that he had, he, had, he had asked them to do, to help them live good, healthy lives. But there was one thing that she wasn't doing or hadn't done um, and that he found out. He sat down with her, tried to find out what's going on here, what's, what's wrong, and uh, discovered that she was harboring unforgiveness, a bitter spirit toward her mother. And uh, he told her, unless she deals with that issue, her health challenges are going to still remain because that was what was holding up the works. And, um, and so they prayed about it. They talked about it. She made an effort to reach out. And lo and behold, the effort resolved itself. It was a beautiful thing. And all of a sudden, her health issues went from high concern to low concern. So when we talk about health, it's not just the physical things that we do. There's also the, the harboring an unforgiving spirit, bitterness, envy. Those things can, can affect the health as well. But I want to talk a little bit about some health things with you here this morning uh, before we go on to the next, um, next contrast. Um, I want to share with you some, some health in life enhancers, health that will bring a healthier life and uh, of course, if we practice these eight enhancers of a longer life, they'll be, our lives will be much better for it. First of all, the first, the first one is eat more, weigh less. Yes, you heard me right. Eat more, weigh less. Eat more whole grains and fruits and nuts and vegetables and minimize and eliminate the high fat, high cholesterol foods. See, I had you there for a minute, didn't I? Yeah. Some of you are listening. Eat more, weigh less. Eat more of the good stuff. You know, the Bible presents three diets. You know what those diets are? There's the unaccepted diet, unacceptable diet. That's the one we read about in Leviticus chapter 11, Deuteronomy 14. Certain land animals, sea, anim sea creatures, birds that we shouldn't eat, scavengers and the like, leave those off the dinner plate. Then there's the acceptable diet. God allowed man to, after the flood, to eat flesh foods. It wasn't, uh, wasn't the ideal diet. It was the permissible primarily because there wasn't any vegetation to eat at the time. So uh, they began to eat uh, clean, particular clean animals. It was permissible. It wasn't a command. It was just allowed. And, um, but then there's the ideal diet. And that ideal diet you read about back in Genesis, of course, and um, where God commanded Adam and Eve to eat from uh, the fruit of the tree, the, the, where the fruit grows and the nuts grow and so on. And so the diet that God had given Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden was the ideal diet. It was the best diet for them. Of course, he's the creator. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows what fuel we need to fuel the, fuel the, the, the tank and keep us moving in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way, in a healthy way. And so he gave them, those, gave them that diet. And we've discovered, science has discovered over the course of, of years, of not, not many years, but few years, that the vegetarian diet is the best diet a better diet than other diets when coupled with other, other things. Back in Australia where I'm from, um, 
uh, I was 17, I decided I'd go vegetarian. My friends looked at me, what, what is that? And why would you do that? And you need your meat. And so I'd be, I'd be the only one that order a vegetarian pizza when I was with my friends. And there was another, there was another person there. She'd, no, no, I'll take some of the vegetarian pizza. I'm trying to go that way too. And I was just kind of doing it for health, pur- health, kind of health purposes. To be honest with you, when I looked at a steak, I was looking at the, the nostrils of a cow. I just couldn't do it anymore. I just, I looked at the meat and I saw the animal. I said, I just, this is weird. I can't do this anymore. It was kind of weird. I, I don't know how it happened or why it happened, but it did. And um, just said, I'm not going to do it. 17. And you know, even at 17, you know, 17, you're filled with energy, the rest of your life before you. I'll tell you, I, I, I felt lighter. I felt like I had far more energy when I stopped, uh, stopped eating uh, flesh foods, uh, meat. Uh, I got to be honest with you though, when I turned vegetarian, I went out. I went out with all the stops. I went to Burger King. We call it Hungry Jack's back there in Australia. I got myself a couple of uh, Whoppers and uh, th- th- had a couple of Whoppers. And I said, okay, now, now I'll be vegetarian. Um, so, but back in Australia, the Medical Journal of Australia was asking the que- asked, asked the question, is a vegetarian diet adequate? Because you often hear, oh, no, no, you need your protein. Oh, you need your iron. You need meat for all of that. No, you don't. The Medical, medical uh, Journal of Australia said in a vegetarian diet, you get adequate protein and you get adequate iron. And of course, there have been little movies that have come out um, that have talked about the benefits of a vegetarian diet and, and books and others. And so this is nothing new. If you know the Bible, you know this is nothing new. And God is asking his people to rise to the occasion and to be examples to those around us, to let people know this is the better way to live, the better way to go. Now, we, we live this way not because we want to necessarily live a longer life. We live this way because we know it helps keep the mind clear. And it's the mind that God has the opportunity to speak to us through. Clogged mind limits the communication. Freer mind, clearer mind. God's better able to communicate with us. And so eat more and weigh less. The other one is exercise reasonably and consistently. It increases uh, lungs, uh, process the air. Uh, Hearts will grow stronger. You're given more stamina. Um, Strengthens the bones. Can lift a person out of depression. Relieves anxiety and stress. All the benefits of exercise far far outweigh the negatives. That is uh, sore muscles, aching back, and, and all the rest. So exercise reasonably and consistently. 